Okay, uh, good morning everybody. I believe we're going live here. I uh, have to say I don't know for sure because um, we've had some te technical difficulties, but I think we're on. on uh, and uh, let me just check here real quick. Make sure, yep, we are. All right. Good. So, uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, name here is Charlie, uh, November Juliet 7 Victor, and uh, I am uh, um, just a little befuddled because we. what happened this morning is we had uh, some technical difficulties and I had to switch over to the old way we stream. We're not on StreamYard today. Uh, we're over on... Uh, um, on uh, Zoom, so but no problem. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, and welcome. This morning, uh, this live stream is a special episode, and uh, it, we usually do this every other Sunday evening, uh, and we schedule uh, uh, you know to have uh, every other Sunday evening a, a new guest. But today, uh, we're doing it in the morning just to accommodate schedules a little bit. So with me the, this this morning is uh, my one of my two co-hosts, Dan, KC Seven MSU. And uh, Brian is out doing uh, his his work flying a jet, so uh, we won't have him today. And our guest this morning is Dick, G0BPS, uh, from England. Good afternoon, I guess, for you, right? Yes, it's about 1.30 in the afternoon here. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And, of course, uh, as always, we have uh, the regular characters in the chat room. If they found their way over here, I'm not sure that they have, but uh, hopefully <laughs> they will eventually. I may, may need to hop into the other chat and uh, tell them to come on over. Uh, also, um, we're happy that you're here, and uh, we'll uh, just jump right in here here in a few seconds and uh, uh, go around and talk about what we've been up to for the last couple of weeks, and then dive into to asking uh, a few questions to uh, Dick. So first, let's intro let's uh, go ahead and uh, talk about what we've been going on. But Dan, if you can take it, and I'll go ahead and see if I can get everybody over here on the uh, from the other uh, side. Oh, sure. <clears throat> um, so <clears throat> I've I've just started, you know, and I finally bought a kx3 a couple years ago and i'm really enjoying uh qrp operations and uh I i've been totally astonished by the number of contacts that i can make with five or ten watts compared to when i used to hit a mountain and and run you know 75 80 watts so and really i get the same signal reports back and, and things like that. So I, I'd kind of like to get your perspective on, so why is that? Why is QRP, in my opinion, it just seems to work as well as when I was running pretty much so a QRO kind of rig on my activations. Well, it's strange because um, I started out in this hobby like uh, many others over here in the UK where um, CB radio became very popular over here and <clears throat> totally illegal, of course. And uh, I got a tap on the shoulder one day by some of the investigating uh, people. And he suggested I sold everything and uh, tried amateur radio. And one of the first uh, speakers I heard at the local radio club was the Reverend George Dobbs, espousing the, uh, the value of QRP. And uh, it, it, it grabbed me. I could suddenly understand what he was talking about and the uh, the wonderful way of actually using low power to actually uh, beat the big guys. And one of the things that entranced me was listening to a lot of your, your cohorts over there in the US, living maybe 10 miles away, running a kilowatt each. And it just proved the point that my five watts could actually get across there and interrupt them. Quite a, quite amazing at times. And as, uh, as you may appreciate, George and I became very close friends and uh, we've traveled an awful lot of the states together. Wow, George Dobbs, he's a great guy. I mean, I've never met him, but he's, he's very influential in the QRP world. Oh. Yeah, we were close friends. Uh, we traveled to the States for 20 years together um, to the Hamvention. And uh, yeah, it's, it's great. He's a lovely guy. I'm, I still miss him. He's uh, died a couple of years ago. Um, and a great influence on uh, so many of the, uh, the worldwide QRPers, not yeah. just here in the UK. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so uh, so how did you get into into QRP? I mean, I, I imagine it was when you were very young, uh, but I don't know for sure. I mean, and uh, and your career, uh, how did that play in? I I started out. Um, I was probably in my mid thirties when I got into uh, ham radio. Um, no, maybe even a bit later than that. Um, <clears throat> 
as I say, I didn't have a choice really. I was it was either I'll see you in court or come and join me at the radio club. Um, <laughs> the the beauty of it was I got my license, and it was very shortly after, just a couple of years later, that uh, I got up together with a friend and started this company. But um, the also at the same time. Um, I was starting to write for various magazines. I, I got grabbed by a magazine that started the one of the QRP column. And that kick-started a whole new world of um, of being an author in several magazines, even some of yours over there. Um, QST published one of mine. I've had something in the uh, the quarterly, of course, many times, and a couple of other local magazines. So uh, quite exciting times. Um, one of the other things I noticed that uh, you perked up about. George and I used to leave the Ham Fenchon and uh, the four days in May and go touring. And one trip, we went up into Michigan and a uh, little village called Luther, Michigan. And we stopped off in a small farm there with a friend of George's and somebody who came a friend of mine as well. You may re recognize the call sign W1FB. Oh yeah, yeah, cool. Doug Demore. Yeah, we stayed with Doug Demore for the weekend and uh, him and his wife, uh, and had a wonderful time there and uh, firing muzzle loaded rifles and all sorts. So uh, a great time had by all. Yeah, that's great. That's a wonderful. That's, I mean, you've rubbed, you've rubbed shoulders with the giants there, haven't you? Yeah, that's, let me just tell you a little story that associated with that. Um, a year or two later, I went across to Connecticut. So my assistant lived there and I went to the AWL headquarters and they have the system where if a visitor walks in and wants to be shown around, um, all of the staff take turns. And this day, it was a guy called Brad Mitchell, whose turn it was to take me and my wife around. And we're walking along this corridor, and he's explaining to some displays that were there. And the guy's walking along the corridor toward, towards us. And uh, I looked up, and I thought, oh, hi, Doug, how are you? And it's Doug Damore walking towards me. And... This guy, Brad, who worked at AWL of course, didn't have a clue who this guy was. So I'm here, this Brit, introducing the star for AWL of course <laughs> to the fabulous Doug DeMore. You yeah. can imagine. Oh my gosh, that's funny. <laughs> Amazing. You know, I, I think that a lot of our listeners, well, some anyway, may not even know what we're talking about when we mention uh, Four Days in May or Doug Demois or, uh, you know, anything along those lines. So, um, and that's kind of why I brought you on because uh, I know you, you kind of wrote a history of, of uh, QRP there in the uh, QRP Quarterly, but but uh, I don't know where to, maybe we should start with uh, Doug Demois and uh, your friend there. What was uh, what was uh, it slips my mind? The first guy you mentioned. George. Uh, yeah, George and George Dobbs. Uh, what made them so? What? Why? Who were they? I mean, what? What made them so special? What? What were? What's the deal with them? I mean, well, I know, but maybe our viewers don't. Okay, each each and every organization throughout the world, no matter what it is, <clears throat> what hobby you have, there always appears. Uh, someone who is known as um, uh, the one to follow, the, the leader, the, the guy who knows everything, uh, who may not be the um, the one who spouts all of the uh, the nasty stuff, but the guy who leads, usually by example. And both of these guys, um, I know that, um, for example, that Doug Demore was George Dobbs, God in the, in the, the QRP fraternity. And I understood later on by talking to Doug that he had the same feeling with George. Uh, over in the US, Doug DeMore was the was the light of QRP, designing, building, operating, and a real leading light in our hobby. Over here in the UK, George did the same. The difference between the two, Doug tended to shrink within himself towards the end of his time, whereas George expanded. We, he traveled to Japan to expand. He was traveling around. To, we used to go down to Friedrichshafen in Germany together. Um, we've we've run um, QRP events over in Ireland together. Um, so George is more worldwide. But these are the leading lights of the QRP hobby throughout the whole of the world, not just in our own individual countries. Right, right. And, and the thing about them is uh, when you say they're, they're the leaders of QRP, um, there's a big component that a lot of new people that are that are new to ham don't understand about QRP and how it's evolved. Because today, 
when you hear QRP, pretty much the only thing that comes to mind, uh, for the most part, is uh, five to ten watts. Uh, you're you're a, 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 a you're an appliance operator. You're you're enjoying the uh, the bands at low power, and you're trying to see what you can do. Doug Dumois, uh did and uh, and George Dobbs uh, were very very well versed in radio design and and uh, building radios from scratch. In fact, uh, let me just show you guys. I have here. Uh, this is a notebook for from Doug Dumois. It's the antenna uh, antenna notebook. And here's what here's the uh, QRP notebook. Here uh, here's the uh, solid state basics, and of course the uh, Bible, the uh, solid state design. Bible, yes. So those books are out of print now, but um, you, maybe you can speak to more a little bit more to how. Uh, QRP was back then versus now, especially when, as it relates to some of these books and uh, and what what went on with the building aspect. I think um, in my own experiences, when I first got licensed, and uh, I learned a huge amount from a friend of mine who I started business with in uh, in '86, where he was he was the design expert and I was the salesman for the company. But through his work and me going across to his house and uh, picking up skills that he had, that uh, we were designing radios for the beginner. Something very, very simple stuff that Joe Bloggs could get his soldering iron made and, and actually build it. One of the things I loved doing at uh, the Hambenchen in, in Dayton was holding out a little miniature toolbox, you know, a little um, toolbox about so big that lift the lid on the top and inside was a one transmitter, the one inch square transmitter and I called it, hey, have you seen my HF rig? Now, this is where fun comes into ham radio, that people are building their own equipment and using it on air. It's not necessarily that all QRPs are operators. We're also builders. And I've got a stack of stuff on my shelf above my head where through the pandemic over here, where I couldn't go out, well, out came the soldering iron and I was building stuff. Right. It's, um, it's not just switch the radio on and operate. We spend almost as much time building as we do operating. And this is where both George and Doug came into their life because they were designing stuff for all of us. Every, no matter what level you were, you were able to build some of their stuff. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, coming some, from my perspective, uh, I came out, uh, I started getting interested in kit build, not kit building, um, in uh, this whole concept of QRP with the uh, homebrew design and, and uh, building. And I had no background whatsoever. I think a lot of people, maybe not, maybe not too many, but a lot of people have an engineering background. Uh, but I didn't really understand anything to do, you know, uh, at all about uh, about uh, the block designs and and you know how to even where to even start. So I, I took a college class on electronics, and and uh, I think I got a basic understanding of of. Uh, what are they of of uh, op amps and, and you know all that the whole kind of all the components and everything. Uh, but still, I, I haven't done a whole lot in, in uh, building. I've done a few kit builds, and, uh, quite a few, but I've not. The only thing I've really built on my own, just using a schematic and, and sourcing uh, sourcing discrete components, was is the uh, Michigan Mighty Might, and I did that because I listened to a podcast. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure you probably know uh, Bill Maher and uh, and uh, Pete Giuliani. I think Pete Giuliani's in the uh, in the QRP. Uh, uh, Hall of Fame, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I listened to their podcast, and, and they had a thing where they were like, hey, everybody, just build this Michigan Mighty Might, see how it goes. So I have one over there, and I build it, and it works all right, But and I had to build some uh, some uh, um, the bass, pan, band pass filters for it as well. But that's pretty much the extent of my experience. So uh, your experience, where does somebody start if they're if they don't know a whole lot about that type of thing? Well, the, the simplest thing is to is to to get a kit of parts, and there's so many organisations, um, especially over there in the US, you can go almost anywhere. Rex Harper, for instance, he's um, he provides a, a multitude of kits for people who want to learn where to start building. Um, it's great. There's other organisations that uh, all over the US. Um, various clubs have their little tiny projects where they'll they'll knock up maybe a dozen kits. NorCal did it for many, many years. Um, the, Dan mentioned a moment ago about his K, K3. Um, I, f I find the thing that Wayne and uh, 
what you've done has been absolutely amazing. Turning up at the, at, uh, the Hamvention with uh, a K2 box, nothing inside it, and getting enough money to actually go, go ahead and produce a, a company or make up a company to produce the K Helicraft rigs that are superb now. And they're knocking the socks of a lot of the big commercial stuff coming in from the Far East. Yeah. Um, so you've got everything from Rex Harper, who provides the little tuna tin kits, right up to what uh, Helicraft are doing now. So there's a multitude of stuff out there. It's available to, to anybody that can actually put stuff together themselves, albeit at any level from the base, absolute basic right up to what uh, Helicraft are providing now. Yeah. Get it there and build it, guys. Good. Yeah, I agree. You know, there's a lot of kit opportunities out there. What about per people who want to know know a little bit more about how those things work, though? I mean, you, you, you build a kit, and a lot of times it's just soldering. You know, you don't really understand how the darn thing works. How, where do you where do you kind of how, what would you suggest that a person do to, to kind of learn how how all this stuff works? We have, you have a great um, <coughs> system over there called the Elma where um, Joe Bloggs can go out or um, whatever you want to call him, um, can go out to his local club and soon somebody will pop up and say, well, I can show you how to do that. I can show you how that works. Uh, YouTube, for example, there's a multitude of stuff on YouTube that you can learn about how things work. Why, why XYZ does ABC in a circuit? Uh, what happens when you uh, put a wrong bias on a, on a circuit somewhere that Everything's out there. If you, if you just look for it, it's, it's available. Yeah. Get out there and look for it, guys. Cool. And and, and what would you say would be the maybe the the first three uh, projects that are not kits, like like going out and getting a schematic, sourcing the the discrete components? What would you say is maybe your top three beginning? Like where should you start? My first um, suggestion would be get the basic components first. Get yourself a large selection of resistors, capacitors, diodes, and um, some sample uh, transistors. Even a simple, you know, two N two 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 will will suffice for a lot of uh, projects that you can put. Do some research. Find a circuit that you like the look of that will do what you want, be it a receiver, a transmitter, um, anything, um, and then draw a diagram of what you want to. Do where the components are placed on the piece of paper. So you're mocking up. You're not looking at a circuit diagram, but where you're physically going to put the items on on the uh, the sheet of paper. So when you come to solder them, you they're actually going in the set sequence that you want them to go, not what may be seen in the circuit diagram. And right. there's a major difference there to be seen. Right, 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 for sure. Yeah, good. Um, yeah, I, I was listening to the Solder Smoke podcast. Uh, I listen to it all the time. So I don't know, maybe a couple, two or three years ago, they were talking about this. They said maybe you should start with something simple like a receiver, and and do that first, and then kind of work your way up to to other components. Maybe even not a receiver, maybe just an oscillator, and just kind of yeah. just do that and kind of see uh, how that build that, and then kind of get familiar with how that actually works and and what the circuitry does, and then move on from there. Yeah, just start small. And there's a huge amount of uh, circuits out there for simple test equipment as well mm -hmm. that uh, you can build. So <clears throat> if you if you find a nice circuit that you want to try, build some test equipment first. Simple test equipment. You can use a ballpoint pen, a diode, and a capacitor, and you've got uh, an RF Pro. Oh, but yeah. You, you can actually chase what's happening in your circuit to a degree. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, I can't just get out there and build stuff. It's it's, it's so exciting. Yeah, you, you mentioned another skill that's that's hard to acquire, and uh, I don't think anymore it's easy to know where to go to find. Uh, YouTube's good, but a lot of people don't know how to test circuits. I mean, they don't understand. I mean, I, and to a certain extent, I'm I'm in that category. I mean, I know a little bit. I've had some experience in some schooling, but you give somebody an an oscill a, a oscilloscope, and they don't know the first thing about you know, how the thing works and, and what it even tells you. Oh, it, it uh, can give you a waveform. Well, what does the waveform tell you? You know, that kind of thing. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's... What to expect from, yeah, what to expect when you probe a, a specific part in the circuit, you know, is, is that what I should be expecting or not? Yeah. I think it all comes with experience though, right? Yeah. Well, you've just called me out because I've never owned an oscilloscope. Oh, well, you don't need an oscilloscope though to, to test gear, right? <laughs> I've never had need for one. Yeah, you can uh, a voltmeter and. Uh, I knew someone who did have one. 
yeah well they're 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 affordable now um let's see so i wanted to talk a little bit the the main reason i brought you on is i i don't think a lot of people know about the qrp amateur radio club international especially my followers on my channel and so i brought you on because i thought you'd be the best to speak to what it is what it offers and uh, and a little bit about it and maybe how you got involved in it well um let's start right at the very beginning um <clears throat> the very first um qrp convention over here in the uk was at the reverend george dobbs church in uh, southern in manchester in 1989 and during that uh, convention george and i had a chat um, and decided we wanted to come across to the Hamvention. And of course, we were there um, displaying some wares for my uh, kits and other stuff from the QRP club. And uh, of course, we very soon held up with the uh, QRP ARCI guys. And uh, of course, I had to sign up and join. And <clears throat> things went from um, bad to worse on that front. <laughs> um, ended up from uh, the absolute very bottom as a brand new member to taking charge, but more of that later perhaps. Um, <clears throat> QRP IRCI stands for um, Amateur Radio Club International, QRP Amateur Radio, um, and it's designed for a worldwide organization based in America. Um, and although a huge number of the members are American, um, it is worldwide. There's no membership fee, you can sign up. But if you wish to receive the magazine, the quarterly magazine, um, called the quarterly, there she goes. Yep. Um, that is available, but you have to uh, have uh, subscribed oh, to the membership fee. Yeah, it's and good. see lots and lots of information in there. And the current uh, issue may well have um, an article by me. Yep, there's uh, some good stuff. Great circuits there. There's always it's, good it's, circuits in there. Isn't there? Last month, last quarter's. Now this right here is what you're talking about, I think, here. Oh, that's the history of QRP. You got another article in there as well, huh? Yeah, I've got another one appearing, uh, downsizing, which I've had to do drastically over the last few years. <laughs> uh, from my 70-foot tower and the four-element tripander down to a bit of wire I laying on the roof. Um, but the QRP IRCI, um, I was invited to go to California, to NorCal, to give a talk one day, and the then president of ARCI grabbed me and asked if I'd be interested in serving on the board of directors. And a uh, bit of a shock, but uh, I said yes. Uh, two years later, I was vice president. Two years after that, I was president. Yeah. And delighted to be the first non-American to be president of the uh, QRP Amateur Radio Club International. Wow, that's amazing. That's great. Congratulations. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. What, a, what, a, what an honor. Um, even more so because uh, the president does three years and uh, they asked me to stay on and do another three. <laughs> so, <clears throat> but after two more, two more years of that, I felt I was getting a bit stale. So I decided to resign and uh, Ken Evans took over. Oh. So <clears throat> you, the history of QRP is not only American, although uh, the first QRP club or organization we know of was in 1949. It was the QRP Research Society over here in the UK, 1949, and it limited the power output to five watts. And surprisingly enough, the guy who started it all was just a listener. He wasn't actually a licensed amateur. In the US, um, it started off in 1961 with um, a guy, Harry Blomquist, who wanted to reduce the uh, kilowatt amplifiers and try people just using 100 watts. It didn't come until the late 70s that um, the ARCI actually agreed with the UK uh, over discussions that five watts output from the transmitter would be the nominal power output for uh, 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 a signal um, from CW or data. And if you're using SSB, it could be 10 watts. And it's been set at that level ever since um, the late 70s, early 80s, when uh, I was also involved in the discussions to about the five watts. Um, I think it's great fun. It's it's yeah. it's, uh, it's part and parcel of the QRP history now that we have developed, and it continues and will hopefully continue even further. 
Yeah. So, so uh, when you join the QRP club, QRP ARCI club, uh, the club does, uh, well, they have the magazine, the QRP, um, uh, the, what is it called again? The, the yeah, quarter, QRP quarterly, Boy. which is good. Good information, uh, especially for people who are like like to build uh, things. Um, another thing that you got your club does is the uh, four days in May thing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I don't think a lot of people understand where it is in, in relation to Dayton and uh, and just can't, they don't. I don't think a lot of people understand it generally. Well, when I first came over to uh, to Dayton for the Hamvention um, in '91, <clears throat> we met in a downtown uh, hotel. Uh, just off the interstate in downtown Dayton. And uh, we just sat in a couple of rooms up on the top floor. We were chewing rag and having a bit of fun and a few guys would be operating. And I think it was the second or third year after that, Bob Grobick uh, suggested that uh, we ought to have something a bit more um, substantial, something a bit more um, done properly rather than just uh, a gathering. And... Uh, he decided that uh, he got to put on an event and he chose the name Four Days in May. Uh, I don't know where he got it from, but it certainly stuck. And it meant that <clears throat> the four days were Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And we took over the Days in South Hotel, south of Dayton, uh, down near Miamiburg. And uh, we started off that the, the Thursday was uh, people just arriving getting to know each other in the evening, uh, having a few beers and uh, just generally chatting. The, uh, the Friday was the, uh, the presentation and uh, get together various events taking place during the day. And Saturday would be the, um, the, uh, the lectures. Sunday, people would be wrapping up and going home. And it developed to such an extent that we were getting three, four, five hundred people turning up. And eventually we lost the place of Days in South and we had to move to the Holiday Inn over in Dearborn. And, uh, sorry, not Dearborn, Fairborn. Um, and we were made very, very welcome. So the four days in May has been going now since 96. And uh, it, it's been hugely successful. And runs in uh, parallel with the uh, the Dayton Hamvention. Yeah, so yeah. so it isn't part of the Dayton Hamvention. However, you know people no, go to the. Uh, I'm sorry. It runs in parallel to it. It's yeah. not associated with the Hamvention uh, at all. They they have no bearing on what we do or, or the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm going. I th I'm pretty sure I'm going to Dayton this year. So uh, to the Hamvention. So I th I think I'll probably stop by the four days in May. Do they do a registration or anything, or do you just show up? Yes. Yeah, you'll need to register, and the registration opens uh, around about February. <coughs> um, rooms at the hotel sell out fairly quickly. Mm. Um, I would strongly advise team up with someone, and then you can share the hotel expenses. Yeah. So uh, for for the uh, four days in May, what is it that the lectures are about mostly? I mean, and, and the conference generally, and the meeting generally. I mean, obviously QRP, but but can you get a little more specific about what you guys talk about there? <laughs> You pick a subject to do with amateur radio and it's discussed. Simple as that. Mm. We, we have, um, uh, well, I, I've, I've been there and I've been spoken about simple um, construction techniques. Um, we've had people talking about SDR, um, every, everything and the, everything you can possibly think about has been uh, lectured at FDIM sometime or other. Okay. And even more in the future. Subjects are not banned at all. Okay. So, okay. So, good. That so it's just wide open and it's not specific to like uh, j just you know uh, homebrew or QRP. So we we're not too keen on uh, commercial uh, speakers coming along and selling their product. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, let's see. Um, what else can we talk about here? Uh, what about some of the books and articles you've written? What are some of the topics that you've uh, you've uh, covered in some of those? Well, the um, I, in, the, in the early 90s, I got grabbed by um, a British magazine, Ham Radio Today, to, uh, to write a QRP column, which went on for about 12 years before the magazine folded. 
and it wasn't my fault, honest. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, all the articles I was writing, I decided that it was time to um, to maybe do some more research and do the uh, introduction to QRP. Uh, that followed on by the history of QRP, um, some books, and uh, the very first four days in May in '96, I took stock of my books across to uh, FDIM and had a table just inside the door. Um, guy came up and said, um, oh, do you mind if I put some of my books on your table as well? So I said, yeah, sure, that's no problem at all. And that was Paul Harden, NA5N, with his um, the data book that he wrote. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but if you ever get a chance to grab a copy, it's well worth having in the shack. It's, it's brilliant. Okay. Um, I've done three books so far, which are they're now well out of print from the 90s. Um, I'm in the middle of writing a book for the Radio Society of Great Britain. They've approached me to do something for them. Um, and what are the topics mostly? QRP is all the construction techniques. QRP uh, operating yeah. or, or and the construction techniques both then, huh? Uh, practical wireless. I was doing antennas, um, antenna testing, antenna building, uh, reviewing new products. Um, other magazines. I was doing QRP um, reviews. Uh, all sorts. Um, they like the way I wrote. Um, surprisingly enough, my my wife is not uh, radio oriented at all. And I always get every time I write something, I give it to her to read. <laughs> Can't understand what I'm writing, but she says the prose is right. So that's uh, that's all that matters, right? <laughs> <laughs> what about Dan? Do you have any other any questions you want to uh, follow up questions you have for him? Well, I, I think. One of the most difficult things, especially for me, is is when you you know you're trying to construct a circuit and figuring out uh, why its performance isn't quite what what you need in order to you know be heard or hear well, and what to do about those things. Um, that's probably the most frustrating part for somebody like me, especially well, if you you know you're trying to design something on your own. Oh, if you're trying to design your something on your own, then it's even more difficult. But having said that, there, I know George used to put together various projects that wasn't a complete radio receiver or transmitter. It was a small part of uh, uh, a transceiver or whatever. Um, and he would have, say, like build the oscillator, and he would have something running that would work perfectly well, say, on uh, 80 meters maybe not so well on 20. But if you actually read up his um, his guides on construction, you can actually pinpoint the parts that uh, you need to put into your circuit and maybe go to someone else and pinpoint a part of their circuit that will work with yours. Um, it, it's not a case of um, going out there blindly and picking, picking a circuit and trying to throw it together yourself because um, one of the greatest things that we find, especially with antennas, for example, that my antenna on my where I live will work perfectly. Put the identical antenna where you live and it will fail miserably, just in different earths and such like. So radios are the same. Um, if you're building <coughs> the, the resistor that you're using, for example, is it the right valued resistor? Is it the right type of resistor? If you're using wire wound resistors instead of carbon, then you're going to be in trouble. So there's all these things to look at as well. The transistor that you want to pick up, bearing in mind that if you if you buy a particular resistor, the identical one with the same name have different pin eights. It may seem very strange, like say um, a two n three eight one nine. If you buy it from one organisation, it'll have uh, the pin eights one way. Buy it from a different organisation, the pin eights will be different. This is something you have to be very very careful of. And it's great to have a little. Um, uh, Thing in your box that um, has all the facilities available for you. I don't know if you can see that. It doesn't show very well, does it? But that's my uh, multimeter, and it's got everything on it. Transistor tester, capacitor testers. I've lost your audio. So, Dick, what was a homebrew project that uh, brought you the most joy that you've done recently? 
I haven't designed and built anything for probably 20 years. Yeah. But what I have done, um, a good friend of mine, I'm oh, sorry, you're hearing a lot about this, my friends, but in, in my position, I've got a lot of friends all over the States and worldwide. Um, if you go to the QRP labs over in Turkey, um, the QCX range of kits from QRP, QRP labs are absolutely magnificent. So you've made um, some of those? Yeah, I've made several of those. Um, during the lockdown, I just ordered, um, I sent off uh, $50 and back came a bag of bits. And they're, the instructions are very much like the old Heath kit instructions, if you remember those, where um, everything has its place and you make sure it goes in the right place and they are superb. Uh, can't recommend them enough. They're really, really good. Okay. Yeah, the, the instructions are fantastic for those kits as well as the, uh, yeah. the explanation of the, of the circuit and what you should expect are, are really, really good. The documentation is excellent. You've enjoyed building as well, then, Dave. So, what other thing? I mean, you said though that you were in lockdown. You you put together quite a few things. So, uh, anything else other than the the QCX Mini? You said you had a whole thing up there, but that was over twenty years or something, I guess, huh? Well, I've got about four or five. Um, I've got four QCX up there. <laughs> oh, four of them. What different bands? <laughs> what bands did you choose? Uh, I think I've got. 40, 80, 20, and 15. Yeah, those are good. I ha I bought one QCX Mini. I haven't put it together yet. Um, and I got, it for, I, I got it for 60 meters. Uh, it's to supplement my MTR3B. I, I think you know the mountain topper MTR3B or wherever. Yeah, so that's a 20, 30, 40. So 60 rounds it out for me. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, so any advice you'd give somebody who uh, says that uh, life is too short to uh, do QRP? Why waste electricity? Why have waste uh. fire on? <laughs> Why waste all that power heating up the air when you can get the same contacts using low power? Um, there's so there's so much out there nowadays. It's not it's not just getting a key out. It's it's getting on just getting on the air. Um, Joe Taylor has given us some fantastic software now that we can use. Um, if you go on the bands and you listen around, um, the CW parts of the bands are fairly quiet. The SSB parts of the bands are fairly quiet. You go on FT8 and it's a horrendous noise. But get out and operate. Yeah, you can have just as much fun and a challenge on low power as you can at ever using high power. Yeah, I guess it, it it just depends on what you enjoy, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Do it if you don't enjoy it. Right. Uh, what do uh, where do you operate mostly? What uh, what bands and and modes do you like right now at this point in your life? Depends on the time of day. Ten meters here has been open um, for the, the last few months and. Uh, I've been uh, doing quite a lot on, on their, those bands. Um, I've recently discovered 60 meters. Um, I hadn't been on there much before. I did a bit of that operating in, back in the spring. Um, 40 meters is good from here as well. Um, but bearing in mind that I'm extremely limited on antennas. Uh, I've got a long wire strung across the roof of the bungalow. Um, I've got a sort of a five meter vertical strap to the side of the house. I, I'm on a, a gated community, so we have the local Gestapo. Got a bit right oh yeah, they don't, sure. it's all no, gotta be conformed. Extra bits and pieces are tacked on the side of the house. <laughs> so uh, my vertical was painted the same color as the brickwork. It hasn't been spotted yet. Oh, good, lucky, lucky you. <laughs> what mode do, uh, do you prefer mostly? Um. I've been operating CW a lot, and uh, even more so recently, in the last uh, few months on 10 meters, using FT8. Yeah, I, I've not been on FT8 yet, but I love Morse code. Uh, uh, how, how, how are your skills on Morse code? Pretty mediocre. <laughs> you can get the contact though, right? Uh, well, I can, uh, I can struggle through. It's, um, it's, 
it's not my best. I yeah. spent 15 or 18 words a minute. Hey, that's all right. That works. Oh, yeah. 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 Good. Um, uh, yeah, go ahead. Really, really nice Brain Brothers key here that I picked up at Taken one year. Um, it, it's quite comical because I was walking around the, the flea market and uh, I spotted this Brain Brothers key, which I don't think I've ever seen one, but they're really, really good. And uh, it's a paddle. And a guy was haggling with the guy, this, this, the guy selling the key. And the guy wanted $100 for it. The guy would only offer him 80 So I stuck my arm around the guy who was haggling and put a $100 bill on the counter and picked up the key and walked away. <laughs> there you go. And the guy that was haggling blew his top. <laughs> well, that's... You wanted 100 I gave him 100 There you go. <laughs> Well, Dick, do you do um, portable ops at all? I, I saw I had a picture out there beyond the bench there, uh, so I guess you do occasionally at least. Um, very little at the moment. Um, I'm I'm struggling with um, space here. I've had to downsize enormously with uh, my station. I've got rid of so much equipment. Uh, what you saw there with that picture was um, a, a, a loop antenna that I was evaluating. Uh, and writing up in one of the magazines. And you'll have seen uh, my K2 in the background there. And uh, I can't remember what I was doing. But that's probably about um, seven or eight years ago now. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, well, so so I guess it, to put it all into a package, I guess, or, or to summarize or whatever, when it comes to QRP, um, I guess today uh, it would be described. You correct me if I'm wrong, because uh, you would know. Uh, today, QRP for the most part, uh, the majority of people who operate QRP do so. Uh, appliance operators, it's called, but uh, they, they basically buy uh, uh, radios that are already built, and many times even antennas that are already built. They just purchase it, take it off the shelf, and then they operate at five to ten watts and uh, try to. Uh, and which is there's nothing wrong with that. I do that. So it's, it's a great challenge, but uh, then if you go back though, uh, before, I don't know, maybe 10 years or more, uh, then you're looking at people who did QRP, mostly did their own, at least a kit, if not uh, took a schematic and sourced the parts and made it. And, and it was also, you, you made your own antenna. So it was more of a, uh, a hands-on, more of a, you, you take something and you, and you get the joy out of building it and the joy out of seeing how it operated to QRP. Is that about right? Nearly. I think that you need to go back a lot further than 10 years ago. Okay. Um, I think the, uh, the large majority of QRP operators are black box operators of some sort or other. Um, a minority will build their own equipment. Um, an even smaller minority will design and build their own equipment. Um, but there are there are some out there. Um, there e are even a lot of um, amateurs that are uh, QRPers who are still using valve equipment. So um, I think basically majority of black box black box operators um, but why not if if that's their interest and the way they want to do their their mm -hmm. hobby remember it's a hobby so yeah. do it the way that you want to do it enjoy yeah. it the way you want to do it yep. and have fun yep that's the way I do it too for so yeah so we, I guess it was a transition then I mean even further back than you said at some point at one point the majority were everybody was kind of building their own stuff and then it slowly transitioned to uh, uh, just black box operators. Is that right, or was it was it different back I then? I don't think there's a transition as such. I think uh, it's always it been that way. One side to the other. Maybe in the seventies um, and eighties, um, when more and more rigs were available that you could wipe down the power. I remember having an old radio that if I put a, a negative voltage on the ALC line, I could reduce the power dramatically on my my high power hundred watt rig. Okay. So. Various ways people were doing things. Okay, so you're saying then that it, that for the most part, then it's always kind of been this way, where the majority are the uh, are the uh, black box operators and and uh... I think the, yeah, a significant number of people would have been black box operators, but mm -hmm. also as a substantial would have been building their own own equipment as well. It's yeah. 
it's an evolving thing. It's not something that uh, you can switch it from one day to the next and say, well, pre this date, we did that. And after that date, we did this. It's yeah. something that flowed from one side to another. Okay. And is it, is it, is it a flowing back and forth or is it, is it definitely trending in one direction? I think it's, a, it, it's just a movable object. It'll just flow <laughs> one way and then another. Yeah. We'll, we'll never know. We'll never know what the answer is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I guess, yeah, there's, there's just two sides to this, isn't there? There's the, there's yeah. those who, uh, you know, there's, there's the people who like to build and, and, uh, then there's the people who just like to operate. And there's a lot more commercial availability of QRP type rigs. I, I think that, uh, the commercial side has seen the profitability of QRP and, and they're willing to invest in that and they don't have to, they know they don't have to build everything as a QRO rig. There's, there's, there's always been a lot of uh, commercially available QRP rigs um, going back to the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And a lot of the uh, big boys now are coming out, like the uh, the new IC705 IC that's only 10 watts. Um, but if you've got the QRP Plus, SNS engineering rigs, um, Tentec, MFJ, lots and lots of commercial uh, QRP rigs out there that are available and have been for some time. Well, okay, so I don't want to uh, make too much of an assumption here, but I assume that you are around in the 80s. And uh, so tell me about some of your most amazing QRP contacts. Uh, maybe watts per miles, maybe your best or whatever. Um, I'll turn that around on its head. Okay. Um, one of the most amazing contacts I made was in 1984 when a friend of mine came over and we set up a station in my uh, house and garden. And uh, we worked station over in the US. Uh, I can't remember the call sign, but uh, we worked off the moon. With what? And it wasn't QRP. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were, we were running a killer lot, but that's the one, the one contact that will forever stick in my mind. Huh. You know, work, work in a, on two meters, working off the moon. Two meters off the moon with a with a kilowatt, and what kind of antenna was it? Was it an array or just a single? Yeah, no, four nineteen LEDs um, on a blackboard uh, configuration. So I was running out of the garden and moving it around. Yeah. <laughs> cool. But uh, on on QRP, um, uh, nothing really sticks to my mind. It's it's. Um, so much so much out there that we've had fun with yeah have you gotten your uh i guess it's they have an equivalent over there or maybe you just it's you just aware of the Q, dxcc it's called uh, you know what that is i'm sure so have you oh yes i know what it is it's i'm, I'm not an award chaser i never have been I'm, yeah um I'm, I'm stacking up um countries on 10 meters at the moment but that's for my pleasure nobody else's right i'm, I'm not interested in uh, going for awards but yes <laughs> we do have awards over here the gqrp club has awards for um for various things um i know our members over here do chase the uh, dxcc and such like um and, and why not if that's their their enjoyment um again it all comes down to what you as an individual want to do and in the way that you enjoy the hobby that you're doing mm -hmm. um it's personal choice yeah. Okay. Well, so I think we're getting close to the end here, uh, Dick. I, I really appreciate you coming on and talking QRP with us. Uh, it's uh, always a good topic, and and especially when we have uh, somebody as experienced as you. It's nice hearing some of the stories about uh, uh, Reverend Dobbs and uh, Doug Dema and about uh, the the four days in May. It's good stuff. Very interesting to me. So, one last thing I'd like to um, to mention to you. Um, you mentioned earlier that about um, the Hall of Fame. Um, I was delighted to get inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1997, um, five years after George. And to my utter amazement, I got the British equivalent this year. Oh, you did? <laughs> oh, congratulations. That's amazing. That's great. Well-deserved. You, you've, uh, you. you've done a lot of great things. So 
Uh, took 20 years to get it though. But. Yeah, yeah, well. Uh, can you tell, real quick before we go here, what is the QRP Hall of Fame? What's the, what's the criteria? How do you get into that? It's, um, it's organized by the uh, ARCI, and uh, anybody can uh, <coughs> have their name put forward. Um, it's not a case of, um, I would say, I would name, nominate you, Charlie, as uh, I think you, Charlie should also be in the Hall of Fame. He's been pretty good to mate, and uh, he's done a lot for the hobby. That won't get you in. You need to um, have a background in promoting QRP um, over a long period of time. And uh, it's it's not given out willingly. It's something that people have to uh, to work for. Um, I still don't know why I got it. <laughs> well, it's because you're you're a great promoter of the hobby. I think probably is why. So congratulations on that for sure. Uh, anything, any parting thoughts that you might have uh, for our guests who really operate portable and and some it's on the air, but uh, you know most of them are QRP operators and uh, really enjoy it. Uh, any anything you'd want to say to them, and then I'll give Dan an opportunity to ask a couple questions if he has any. Basically. The simple thing really is get out there and enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, why bother? <laughs> Wait and enjoy. Yep. Dan, do you have anything? I know. I, I, I've been really appreciative of, of your time today. I learned a lot and a lot of stuff I didn't even know, even though I've in, been enjoying, you know, uh, operating QRP over the last couple of years. And uh, I never thought I would enjoy it, but it, it's amazing, you know, being able to uh, make a contact with minimal wattage is, is pretty amazing. Yep. All right. Well, I think somehow I am going to have to figure out how to get the, the stream to end. And so let me bring up my thing here. But uh, I really appreciate, uh, uh, Dick, appreciate you coming on. Maybe, I don't know, are you going to be, uh, are you going to be in Dayton again this year at all? Oh, I'm afraid um, finances don't allow it now. Yeah. Uh, I'm an old age pensioner, and uh, <laughs> it uh, we have to uh, reduce our expenditure in uh, various ways. And I've uh, I've got my wife to look after and make sure that she has as much fun as I do nowadays. Yeah. All right. Well, it was good meeting you over the airwaves then here through uh, through Thank Zoom. Uh, it's a pleasure. So we're going to end it there then. So uh, thanks uh, for joining us, Dick. And I want you to stay on. And we'll, let me just uh, wrap up, wrap this up and uh, end the stream. And then we'll chat a little bit more. But thanks to all those who are in chat and who will be listening later. Uh, 73 to everybody. And uh, you know.